All right, so we were working on these examples um, on partial fractions, correct? Where did we leave off? We did, we finished C? We got the A, B, and C? Should I finish it? No? Yes? Okay, then you need to help me because I don't have any of that written down. Our new integrals should have been, okay. Go ahead. It's going to be x over x plus 1, x minus 1 squared. What is it? Oh, no, never mind. Yes. x plus 1. Let me, let me see. This is, this. this is what you got? Let me borrow it for a second. OK, so we had a, which was negative 1 fourth over x plus 1. Then plus b, which we got to be 1 fourth over x minus 1. And then c, which we got to be 1 half over x minus 1 squared dx. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Now, and, and this was just, here you go. This was just one part of it, right? Wasn't there another part? Because we had done long division. And when we did the long division, in your notes, we had an x plus 1 and then plus the remainder out here, right? So we, we integrated x plus 1 and we got, one did we? 1 half x squared, one half x squared plus, plus, plus x plus 4. Plus 4. Plus 4. Plus 4, plus four, plus four, when you four just multiplied by x. Oh, you need a 4 down yeah. here? Yeah. Right here? Yeah. OK. All right, so I left off with us just needing to resolve this. All right, so there's a four out here. Each one of these I should be able to handle. So this first one, because it's a linear expression, you have a constant up top. This should be a natural log. This one, same thing. Linear expression, constant on top. That's going to be a natural log. This one is not going to be a natural log because it's a linear expression squared. Right? So, but we could still do that because that was in our list of preliminary integrals. So let's handle those first two. Um, I bring the negative 1 fourth out. It multiplies times 4 and becomes negative 1. So we'll have negative natural log of x plus 1. And then this one, positive 1 fourth comes out, hits the 4, so that's positive 1, natural log of x minus 1. And then who can tell me how I'm going to do this one? U sub. Just a u sub. What's u going to be? X minus 1. X minus one. And so this really will turn into, like bring the 1 half out, it's really like 1 over u squared. And the antiderivative of 1 over u squared is negative 1 over u. Right, I'm hoping we've done that enough that if you had to do that, you could. Yes? No? So I'll have a plus and then 1 half and then we're saying negative 1 over u, right? which should be x plus 1, or x minus 1. And uh-oh, I forgot my 4. No, it went away when you pulled out the 1. Four. Yeah, I need this 4 for this half. So that would actually be a what? 2. And then plus c. And then that should be it. Now, what was the part, again, that we integrated in the very beginning? Was it this right here? So 1 half x squared plus x. So your final answer, okay, after all the work we did, should be 1 half x squared plus x minus natural log of x plus 1 plus natural log of x minus 1 plus, uh, well, I'll make this a minus, minus 2 over x minus 1 plus c. Ron, you're going to have to pull up somewhere. I don't know if there's enough room. I don't care. Yeah, that's fine. Still knock my camera over. Oh, is that you? Yeah. You got it? Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. I don't want to knock over anything over here. 
Good, yeah. <laughs> Got rejected. Okay. Um, let's move on, though. We're going to do the, the next integral up here. I did finish all the problems, um, the homework problems for this section, the videos for them. So all the problems that I'm going to ask you to do for homework for this section, the solutions are up on YouTube now, all right? All right, so for D, we have integral 2x squared minus 4x, or sorry, minus x plus 4 over x cubed plus 4x dx. So we, we have a quadratic function on top, a quadratic polynomial. We have a cubic polynomial on the bottom, right? Uh, so this is a rational function. So we're starting to think partial fractions possibly. The degree of the numerator is 2. The degree of the denominator is 3. So are we going to need long division? No long division, right? This power, if it's bigger than this, we're, we're free to move on to the next step. So what was the next step? Remember? Factor the bottom, right? Factor the bottom if possible. Does that factor? It does, but not, not very much, right? All you can do is what? Just pull an x out. So this becomes the integral 2x squared minus x plus 4 over x times x squared plus dx. <clears throat> now, if you look back at the, at, I, if you have your notes with you, I want you to kind of look back at a, b, and c. For part a, we had long division, and it worked out. We didn't even need to do any of the partial fraction stuff. It was just long division. Part b, we did a factoring out, right? And then we factored the entire denominator. Can somebody tell me for part B, when we factored the denominator, what we had down there? It was like x and then, what is it? 2x minus 1 and x plus 2. And then we had all the junk on top, right? That, that was part B. And so we said for part, for part B that this was what? 1, 2, 3 distinct linear factors, right? And so then that forces us to do a over x, b over 2x minus 1, and then c over this, right? In part c, our denominator, once we went through and, and cleaned it up, it factored to be, was it x plus 1 times x minus 1 squared when we factored? And so we said that this was, again, two distinct linear factors, but one of them was repeated. And so we, we still dealt with that by doing a over this, b over this, but without the squared, and then c over this with the squared. You kind of remember doing that? OK, this right here is different than those in the sense that we have a distinct linear factor here. We do have a distinct linear factor. It's it's really like that, right? Or if you like, you could write x minus 0. That's a distinct linear factor. <laughs> this, though, is not a distinct linear factor. It's a quadratic factor, right? And it's irreducible, meaning that you can't factor x squared plus 4 any further, can you? Can't be broken down? If it was x squared minus 4, yes, it could be broken down. So the question becomes, how do we handle something with partial fractions if you have an irreducible quadratic factor. So here's what you do. That's, that's what you do. I, completing the square was suggested. That is what you do if that's the only thing down there. But that's not the only thing down here. We have an x attached to it. We will eventually probably need that, though. Because remember I said we're going to build a problem to the point where we can do something from the preliminary stuff? All right, so here's what we'll do. The partial fraction technique for this one is to rewrite everything
Every single time you ever see a linear factor, a distinct linear factor, you put A over that distinct linear factor. So that's not different, right? That's the same as what we've done before, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK. Plus, now you may be thinking, well, why not just put B over this, right? Put B over this. That's, that's the difference. Anytime you have an irreducible quadratic like this, you don't put B over it. You put BX plus C over the distinct linear, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, irreducible quadratic. So think about why we would do this. The reason we did this is because the bottom is linear, the top is a constant, right? What's the derivative of a linear function? A constant, right? So we know that if this somehow becomes a u, the derivative of it is up there, and we can handle it with natural log. This, though, if the bottom is an irreducible quadratic, what is the derivative of an irreducible quadratic? It's linear, right? So we want the top to be linear so we can call the bottom u and then do the same sort of thing. Does that make sense? Now, the notes explain this, and I haven't even referred to these, have I? I haven't even, because I told you they're, I think they're too crazy to look at right away. I will come back to this and I'll recap it. But first, let's just see, see the rules in action. So for every irreducible quadratic factor, I will place it underneath some arbitrary linear, linear expression. Okay? And that's it. Now we come through and do what we did before. Multiply both sides by the LCD. So. My think tank's going to start out today. Whoever wants to at the table. If you multiply both sides by the LCD, what's the left side going to be if I multiply by the LCD? Hold up. What? All right. 2x squared, Christie's out. 2x squared minus x plus 4. Same table. What's this going to be? A. A. Parentheses? Yes. OK. Because the x's cancel. And then here, what cancels? So anyone? Bx plus c times x. So plus bx plus c, right? Put that in parentheses. That's very important. You put that in parentheses because it's that times whatever was left over here. What was, what's still left over? The x. Does everybody see that? that that's what happens when you multiply both sides by the LCD. The things that cancel. I mean, imagine this thing right here, the x's go away. Imagine this thing right here, the x squared plus 4's go away. Do you all see it? All right. Now, last class we played this game where we, remember I was talking about that little god complex, right? And you you get let, to, let something be whatever you want it to be, and then you get things to go away, right? <laughs> <clears throat> when you look at this here, we're trying to solve for how many different variables? Three variables, right? So let's see. <clears throat> Can I get A? Well, I'd have to kill this off over here, right? What could I do to kill everything off over here? Let x be 0. And I, I, right, if x was 0, it would kill off everything, and I could just get this. Are you ever going to be able to kill off A? Why not? That's right. You can never plug a number in here that's going to make this 0, unless you bring in the imaginary numbers, and we're not going to do that, right? So you can't kill this off, which means there's no way you can actually get rid of the A ever. So we need to go to the longer technique. Did I do the longer technique last time? I didn't, right? So what is the longer technique? The longer technique is you just have to multiply everything out on this side. You actually have to distribute the A through. Here you have to distribute the x through. You might remember this from pre-cal. Then you have to put all the x squares together. The x then you collect like terms, yep. So let me put this together. So I would get ax squared plus 4a plus bx squared plus cx. So that's just distributing through. When you get things like this, 4 times a, we usually write the 4 times a. We don't write a times 4. Right? 
Same thing with this, Cx, we usually put the C in front of the X because C is going to be a number at some point, right? So now what we do <coughs> is we rewrite the right side and we collect like terms. So I'm going to go slow this first time through. Those are my X squared terms, right? So I'm just going to place them side by side, AX squared plus BX squared. So I've taken care of those two. I'm just kind of re I'm rewriting things. Now I'd like for you to find anything in here that has just x in it. Just the cx right here. So I've taken care of that. And now write down anything that doesn't have any x's in it. 4a. You with me? All right, now if you have like terms, like these two, that means there's something I can factor out of both. What can I factor out of both of these? An x squared, right? So you would normally write it like this, right? You would write x squared a plus b. Like if you pull the x squared out, that's the way you'd write it. But is it incorrect to write it this way? Oh. With the x squared in the back. No, because it's the same thing, right? It's going to multiply through. You get the same exact expression. So I'm going to do it that way, and you'll see why. a plus b x squared, then plus cx plus 4a. So I didn't have any more x's to group together here and anything else without x's, so that's the way it's written. All right? So in the long way, you're not trying to kill anything off. You're just trying to multiply it all out, get all like terms together, group them all up, and then take a look at them. If this equation, if this equation is going to be true, then do you agree that the number in front of x squared here must be equal to the number in front of x squared here? However many x squareds there are over there must match how many x squareds there are over here. Yes? And the number in front of x here, which is what? Negative 1. That number of x's needs to match up with the number in front of x here, right? We're trying to say these two sides are equal to each other. So what we're doing is we're matching coefficients. The coefficient of x squared must match the coefficient of x squared. The coefficient of x must match this coefficient of x. And the number that's by itself, 4, must match the thing out here that's by itself without any x's, right? So what we get from this are three relationships, right? We get the relationship between a plus b and 2, the relationship between c and negative 1, and the relationship between 4a and 4. And that's three equations that we can now create. And there are three unknowns, aren't there? And so I'm going to write down those three equations using the symbol for a system of equations. The first equation says a plus b must equal what? 2. two. So I'm going to write a plus b must equal 2. And now I left a space here because in reality my three equations, there's three variables, a, b, and c, so I'm leaving a column for each variable. What does my next equation say? c must be negative, negative 1. Well, that's nice. c is negative 1. And then what does the last equation say? 4a must equal 4. What's that? A equals 1, B equals 1, C equals negative Yeah, so from this, we should be able to get this. This is not going to require much work, right? Because I already know what C is. C must be negative 1. Um, do I know what A is? Solve this equation so I know what A is. And if I know what A is, can I get B? Yes. But the, the bigger picture is that with this process, you actually create a system of equations. And this is, system of equations could be very easy to solve, like this one, or it could be very difficult to solve. Just depends on the problem. So we'll, we'll look at one that's a little more difficult than this in a minute, but everyone with me? So A is 1, um, C is negative 1, and, and what's B? How do we get it? Well, A is 1, right? So just move 1 to the other side and subtract 1 on both sides. So B is 1. 
That's it. That's what we needed. We needed A, B, and C. So we have integral. It was A over, sorry, I shouldn't write A. It was A over X, right? A over X. So A for us was 1. So 1 over X. Then it was plus. Oh, wait, didn't we do long division? No, we didn't. Not on this one. Never mind. Um, then it was BX plus C over X squared plus 4. BX plus C. So B was 1. So 1X plus C, but what's C? Negative 1. Negative one. So X minus 1, is that all right? Over? x squared plus 4 dx. I, I think we all would agree that that first one is easy, right? Natural log of x. How about this one? A u sub? You'll be off a little bit, won't you? There's a couple of ways you can solve this, so I'm going to I'm going to take some volunteer answers here on how you would want to solve this. First, split them up. You want to split them up? Okay, that is definitely one approach. Another approach would be try u sub and see what happens. Just like let u be the whole bottom, and the derivative of that is what? Two x, and you're off, but you could tweak it maybe. But I like the idea of splitting because the splitting should come out pretty clean. Natural log, absolute value of x. That's the antiderivative of this. Plus two new integrals, x over x squared plus 4 dx, and then minus integral 1 over x squared plus 4 dx. So putting the x over this, the negative 1 over this, and I pulled the negative out. Everybody follow that? All right, let's move to the next table. So any ideas on either one of these integrals? U sub on which one? First one, U sub, yep, that's going to work. How about this one? Let them think about it. While they're thinking about it, I'm going to do some U sub over here. If you do a u sub on this one, right, u is the entire denominator. So u is x squared plus 4. The derivative of that is 2x dx. Do you have 2x dx? No, you're off, so you scale by 1 half. And so that one works this way. And then, yes, arctan. All right, this is the one that we love to see. 1 over variable squared plus constant squared. So this one's arctan. So minus, how does that formula work again? It's minus formula 17. 1 over a, what's a for us here? 2, it's the square root of this. So 1 over 2, arctangent of what? u over a, so for us, x over 2 plus some constant. Yes? Uh, for that arctangent one, could you factor out the x with the squares and then put it in the parentheses? Not sure. x plus 2 squared. x plus 2 squared, though, is not x squared plus 4. So. We good? Sure there's no questions? <clears throat> Kiki, when you said split them apart, did you see that you would be able to do both of those things ahead of time? 
kind of? Yes? Did you see Arctan there? No. No? Okay. Just curious, that's all. All right, let's look at the, was this the last example? 4x Four, squared minus 3x squared or minus 3x plus 2 over 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. All right, we're back at, um, going back to the table there in the back corner, Vanessa Rubin. Anyone? Okay, which means long division first. All right, so we've got to do that. So here comes long division. 4x squared minus 3x plus 2. So I did long division in my college algebra class yesterday. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. And I told them that in my Cal 2 class, we're, we're actually using it. And they didn't care. <laughs> 1440. They said, they said they would deal with that when they get here. But for now, they didn't like it. All right, so what is the first number that I'm going to multiply by? One, right? One is going to create what I need here, 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. I come through, I subtract the row. So minus, plus, minus, right? So it became minus, plus, minus. So what's remaining down here? X minus 1? Can I keep going? No. Long division is over. So I put plus the remainder over the divisor. And that's going to be my new integrand, that right there. One piece of it I'll be able to integrate pretty easily, right? The other I'm going to have to take a look at. So my new integral is 1 plus x minus 1 over 4x squared minus x plus 3 dx. which is x plus the integral x minus 1 times 4x squared minus x plus 3 dx. Uh, yeah, did I forget to write it over there too? Oh, forgot to write it in two places. What was I looking at? Okay, good up to here. What now? We're at Ethan's table. Anyone over there? How, how do you mean? Okay, so yes, you always look, can we factor the bottom? If we can, then we'll probably get distinct linear factors and we'll use the A and the B thing. If this factors. So does it factor? It's the same as the original, so what would What's that? It's the same as the original. We never tried factoring here, right? We never did because it was the same degree, so we just divided long division first. This is our first real attempt to factor it. Does it factor? It does? Okay, we are at x plus integral. The top is x minus 1, and the bottom factors to b. Should we just do, like, take out a sheet of paper? Let's take a quiz. Everyone factor this? Come on, y'all got to be able to factor this. It doesn't factor? 
looks like it does, but there's, there's, a, there's a negative. negative. There's a negative messing it up. So it doesn't factor? It does? It doesn't? Yeah. Uh-oh. All right, so I'm only going to show this one time because we, sh we shouldn't be even taking time on this. But no, it should work. So you multiply those two numbers together, right? You get 12. You look at the number in the middle, which is negative 4. You have to come up with two numbers that multiply to be this, but simultaneously those two numbers must add to be this. So the only two numbers that you're going to get to multiply to be 12 would be 1 and 12, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. And of course, you could also do negative 1, negative 12, negative 2, negative 6, negative 3, negative 4, right? But there's no way, no other way to get 12 than these combinations, right? But if you add any of these two together, you cannot get negative 4, right? None of these add up to be negative 4. So does not factor. Can you use the formula? What formula? Like the quadratic formula, that would give us a solution, but see, we don't have an equation, right? First of all, we don't have an equation. The reason I'm not saying no is because you can actually use a quadratic formula to factor something, but it's a little tricky. What's probably going to happen is you're going to get um, either imaginary numbers or you're going to get irrational numbers. Just think about, think about the part in the quadratic formula that would be this piece right here. It would be negative, would it? Four, it would be b, this is b, right? b squared would be 16 minus 4 times a would be 4, and then c would be 3. And so you get 16 minus, yeah, it would be a negative number, which means it's an irrational number, which means this does not factor. Okay, just because this fails doesn't mean it doesn't factor, it just means you can't factor it, right? There's a difference, <laughs> right? It just doesn't factor over numbers that we know out of our heads. This proves it can't factor over the real numbers, period. So we are stuck now with a linear expression over an irreducible quadratic, right? And we're moving on. Paul, Luke, Matthew, how do you deal with a linear expression over an irreducible quadratic? How did I show you you should try and deal with a linear expression over an irreducible quadratic? Take your time. Take your time. I'm hearing complete the square. I agree complete the square will, will come into play. Not yet, though. No. Nope. Anyone? Basic U substitution first. Look at this, this is really important because I do this different than the book does this, all right? This is the technique I always use when I see an irreducible quadratic and a linear expression on top. I always try and make the numerator look like the derivative of the denominator. That's what I always like to do. So I let the bottom be u. I let the denominator, I mean, the derivative, let's see. What would the derivative here be? 8x minus 4, right? Parentheses dx. I did this last class. Let's see if this is starting to set in a little bit. I would love my numerator to be 8x minus 4. It's not even close to being 8x minus 4, right? So what did I do to force it to be 8x minus 4? What did I, what did I do first? First, I'm going to do 8 over 8 out here. Multiply by 8 over 8 right out here. Then pass the 8 on the top through both terms on the numerator. What do I still have outside the integral? 1 over 8. One over eight. I pass the 8 through to both terms. Don't forget to pass that 8 through here. I did number 31 today this morning. It was the first problem I did this morning. I was, guess I was getting warmed up because I forgot to pass this number through both. And I did like the problem took me like 20 minutes. And then I realized I messed up. And then I had to redo the entire problem. So it's not on the video. You won't see it. That, <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's, it's deleted already. But I'm just pointing out, don't forget to pass that 8 or whatever the number is through to both terms. 
And then on the bottom, you still have this, right? So does this match yet? Does not match. What I really want to have here is what? Minus 4. Secret 0. We have a hidden 0 here. So this is where we come in here and we say right next to this x, right behind it is, what do I want? Minus 4. But I can't just minus 4. I also have to what? Add 4. Now look, I've had students say this to me before and this is correct. Look, if you have 8x minus 8, some people will just look at that and say, obviously, that's 8x minus 4 minus 4. Right? I mean, isn't it? Isn't 8x minus 8, 8x minus 4 minus 4? And I'm not here to disagree with you. But potentially, these could be numbers that are not clean. They could be fractions. And so this hidden 0 is just something that I show you because it will always work that way. You could just you know, subtract it and add it and then deal with this other thing in a minute. Do you understand what I'm saying? Cheating. What is this one? This way? Cheating. That's cheating? <laughs> it's zero. You can't add a zero. Sure you can. How do you add nothing? You add nothing and it doesn't change, right? Yeah, you can't add anything. Yeah, but look. You stay out of this. It's not a thing that. To it's actually. He's the were, teacher. It's like were, 30 of us versus <laughs> were you? Do you remember? Were you in the the um, after class? Were you down there when we were talking about the twelve field axioms, like what it requires for a number system to be considered a field? Oh, we were talking about the dates right now. Was it ten like the different ten properties. Ten towers, ten towers, yeah. Yeah. The real numbers. The real numbers. One times one is two. Hey, you got yes, we were talking about that. One times one is two. Yes, that thing. So. The real numbers make up what's called a field in mathematics. That's a very, very strong thing to be a field. And one of the properties of a field is that every field must have what's called an additive identity. It's a number within the, num within the numbers. There is some element that when you add it to every other number, it doesn't change the number. So x plus 0 equals 0. That is, 0 is the additive identity for the real number system. Similarly, every field must have what's called a multiplicative identity, a number that when you multiply it times any number in the field, you get itself. And 1 is the multiplicative identity. So as trivial as it may seem that, you know, really we're kind of cheating, no. The real number system being a field guarantees us we can always add nothing to something. And it doesn't change the problem. So it's a little, it's even more fundamental, I guess. All right, let's get back to the adding of the nothing. All right, so we go 8x, and then we go what? Minus 4 plus 4. There's my hidden 0. Then minus 8. All over 4x squared minus 4x plus 3 dx. All right. So where were we? We're at Luke Paul. So we're up here at Zach, Chris, Ivana, Alejandro. Why am I doing this? Like, why am I trying to do all this voodoo magic stuff. Hold on. OK, so that the U sub that we originally wanted would work. So that means I'm going to split this, right, Ivana? Yeah. And you're telling me, Ivana, that then that first part where I split it, these two over this are going to work out, yes? Can you tell me, Ivana, what remains and how I will deal with that? Mm -hmm. And then the 4 can come out and then become a 2. OK. And then the bottom, we have to complete There you go. That's it. So the whole idea behind this is that you, you almost had something in its derivative. You tweak it with this little magic thing that's happening, whatever. It's not magic. And then the, the first part becomes that nice thing you wanted. And what remains, notice what remains doesn't have an x anymore. See, the x threw everything off here, right? If that x wasn't there, we would have just completed the square and been done. But because the x is there, we couldn't. So we forced the x to be part of a, a nice thing. And then what remained is the number over the quadratic, and we'll complete it, complete the square. All right. 
So let's rewrite where we are here. We've got x plus 1 eighth integral 8x minus 4 over 4x squared minus 4x plus 3 dx. That's one integral. The other integral is this minus this. That's negative 4. What happens when I bring negative 4 outside? Negative 1 half. Okay. Integral and then what? I pulled the negative 4 out already. So what's up there still? 1 over and then the denominator, right? 4x squared minus 4x plus 3dx. This one's going to be a basic u substitution. This one, because look, there's u. Where's its derivative? Right up there. That's exactly the derivative, perfect. It's almost like someone made it for us, right? Oh, wait, that was us. We made it like that, right? Like we did that so that that would work out, right? And then this one no longer has x up here. So how do we handle an irreducible quadratic with a constant on top? We complete the square. So you see, these are going back now. See, before we started, I said, what, what do we need to know how to do? And this right here, linear over irreducible quadratic, was one of the ones that we need to be able to do. Constant over irreducible quadratic, this one is something we need to be able to do. All right, completing of the square. Kiki said she's going to help me with this one because she said that she enjoyed completing of the square. No. Okay, well, we're back at this table, so someone up and Christy's out. So when you come back through, if you already answered, you can't answer. That's correct. Do you want to go ahead and continue then? Alex? Yes? You have to make sure it's a 1 in front. So how do I do that? Just take a 4 out. So that gives me x squared minus x plus 3 fourths. I'm completing the square here, everyone, right? Then you identify the number in front of x, which for us is negative 1, right? And you take half of it. So I'll do that right here. Negative 1, half of it. That's my first number that's going to come into play. Then I square that, don't I? Negative 1 half times negative 1 half is going to be 1 fourth. And that's my second special number. Which one of these numbers is the one that I come in here with that, that 0 again? <laughs> Which one of these do I use? The second one, right? The 1 fourth. And I'm going to do what with it in here? Plus it and minus it, right? Add it and subtract it. And where do I do that? In between. Right? The Be the between the x term and the constant. So I have 4x squared minus x plus a fourth minus a fourth plus 3 fourths. And I'm guaranteed, we're moving on to the next table. I'm guaranteed. Who answered last time? Karen? Who did it? All of you did? It was like in unison? You're all okay, so anyway, I don't care then at that table. What are you guaranteed is going to happen here? Like with this? Perfect square trying to win right here, right? This is going to be? X minus a half. X minus a half. Where'd that one half come from? That's this number, right? Squared. And then this, you just put these together. What's negative 1 fourth plus that? It's a half, right? That's all in parentheses with the 4 out front. So this expression becomes this expression, becomes this expression, becomes this expression. And so I can rewrite this integral right here. Oh, by the way, what was the antiderivative of this because of the way we designed it? This is 1 over u, right? So ln. So we should have 1 eighth natural log of the whole u, right? 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. OK, 
Okay, so that integral is taken care of. This one, we had a negative one half out here, right? And we're going to put on the bottom here this expression. What about that four? Pop it out, and this becomes really what? Negative one eighth. Integral of what? One over x minus a half squared plus one half dx. All right, we're moving back. Next table. Reuben, did you answer last, Reuben? Who answered over there? No? <clears throat> you answered, didn't you? I thought you and Kelly answered. No? You kind of, um, I heard you say long division, right? Okay. Ruben or Vanessa? This is formula 17, isn't it? This is formula 17. Now there's a little bit of an issue here because this is not just u, right? It's a little linear expression, so you might need, I'm not, I don't know, this depends on you. Like if I was doing the problem, of course, I would just go right to the answer, but you might need to do a little quick u sub on this. Right, x is, uh, u is this piece right here. The derivative of it is dx. And then that whole little, this whole little integral right here becomes integral 1 over u squared plus a half, right? That's all it, all it is. And now you can go to formula 17. And what is a for us? Square root of 1 half. Square root of 1 half, right? It's always going to be the square root of this number. What is the square root of 1 half? That's 1 over root 2, which is fine with me if you write 1 over root 2. You could also write that as root 2 over 2. I don't care. I think I'm ready for the final answer, aren't you? All right, so we've got x plus 1 eighth natural log 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. Minus one eighth, right? Minus one eighth times now formula seventeen is one over a arctangent u over a. What's one over a for us here in this problem? It's one over one over root two, right? Which flips it and just makes it root two. Arctangent of u over a, but what was u? x minus a half over a, but a is 1 over root 2 or root 2 over 2, however you want to write it, plus c. And that's good enough. Yeah, you could do root 2 over 2 and then pop that 2 up top and make it a 2x minus 1. But you'd still have a root 2 on the bottom. So what do you all think? Any, uh, what's that? You want, ch you want to check it? Really wouldn't be that bad. But, okay. So that's it, huh? Partial fractions? So I, I suggest you go and take a look at the, you know, do all the homework. Um, some of the problems in the homework get a little more complicated than the ones that you see here. That's why I posted the solutions, so you could go take a look at them. And what did I give you last time for homework? Did I write down an assignment? Okay, 7 through 12 all? Okay, so what I'd like for you to do now is just do 13 through 41 odd. Hey, I did 13 through 41 odd. It was fun. It wasn't as long as the previous section's homework.
But, yeah, I guess so. So everyone have that? Same page. So it's page 334. What I'm really looking for you to do is 7 through 41 odd. I think that's what I did on my videos. I asked you to do 7 through 12 last class because I was just trying to get you to, the first few problems all had the same technique. So I was just trying to give you a little repetition. Now I have not done the evens. I didn't do the evens on the video, which makes me feel like the evens would be probably a good place to draw a test problem from, right? I haven't provided you the answer for it. All right. Now, 6.4 is the next section. We're not going to do 6.4. 6.4 is a section about using the actual table of integrals in the back of your book, but like the entire table, everything, all 100 and whatever, 120 formulas. So they give you in 6.4 some, some integrals where they just look really bad and then you, you make like a basic U sub and you look at it and you go, okay, yeah, that's formula 103, you know, and it's just an exercise in matching a pattern to, to a formula in the back. And I think it's, you know, there was a point in time in history where that was probably worth it to have that table and go to it and that way you don't have to do the integral by hand. But nowadays, why go to the table when you can go to Wolfram Alpha and get that to do the entire integral for you anyway, right? So if we're going to be resourceful, going to a table is not option one, right? Resourcefulness means going to Wolfram Alpha and getting an answer. So, yes? I was going to say, can we use Wolfram Alpha on the test? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's raise your hand. Engineers first? Okay, I've got a stack of degrees. Just come up here. I'm going to give you your degree. Just write your name on it. Come on. Good try. <laughs> All right, so 6.4, I'm skipping. All right. And that brings us to 6.6, .6, which is called improper integrals. We can't do improper integrals yet because we've avoided something this entire time. And that was those numbers. Do you remember every homework problem, every homework set that I ever said, if there were numbers there, that you just ignore the numbers and don't worry about them, and we'll deal with them later, right? Well, now is later. Yes, we're doing this now. Is that okay? No, no, I Okay, all right. So I want to make sure it's okay with you before I proceed. All right, so we have to take a huge step back now, all right? Huge, huge step back and take a look at some stuff that may seem completely unrelated to what we're doing, like what we've been doing. But I told you it was going to be that way. I told you that we're going to try and attack these problems, but the first thing we need to do is learn how to integrate. Once we learn how to integrate, then we can do some applications. So with that said, I'm going to, where is it? I had it open a little while ago. No, no, I'm not doing 6.4 right now. This is actually 5.2, five, 5.3, five, and 5.5 five, five all together in just one big blah. Okay, it's, because we're going back, it's kind of hard to blah, yes. All right, can we, uh, Vanessa, can you kill one light, please, for me? So like I said, kind of clear your head a little bit, and, and sorry to make some of you look backwards, but this, this is not really a chapter in the book, which is why I'm calling it Chapter R. And it's going to stand for Riemann sums. Riemann sums. So is everyone's mind cleared? Is that a reference? Yes. <laughs> Our motivation. So where, does this, where, where are we going to start here with this brand new topic? 
The motivating idea is the classic area problem. So for many, many years, hundreds of years ago, you know, depending on your view of the way things were or how they have come to be, I hope that we could all agree that at some point we started to separate ourselves with barriers, right? This is mine, this is yours, right? Stay off of my stuff, I'll stay out of your stuff, right? And we started to create these borders between us, right? Whether it be a group of people or countries or whatever, or this is my land, that's your land. And so at some point we had to figure out clever ways of measuring you know, how much that is, like what is that, how much is in there. So on a two-dimensional picture, this would be a representation of area, right? Length times width. And so we all know that the area of a rectangle is length times width, right? And if we got something more complicated like a triangle or something like that and we wanted to know the area, then, then we know that that's what? What's the area of a triangle? One half base times height, right? Yes. So why is it that way? Just well, here's a different looking triangle that doesn't look half of, like half of a square to me. Would you agree? If you turn your head, I'm turning it. Yeah. So to do this, you actually have to do. You have to create a second version of this, right? So draw another one of these, but take this and rotate it and flip it over and draw it backwards. It'll look like this. Oh, I messed it up. Okay. Good enough? Is that good enough? That's this picture like this. That's terrible. Yeah, I went too far out here. Yeah, it's not drawn to scale. Okay, is that a little better? No. Nope. <laughs> All right, so now the height is this, and the base is now here, right? Do you all see it? And then if you take some scissors and you just come and cut this off and take that and put it right here, then now you've created a rectangle. And how, how long is the rectangle here? The base and how tall is it? The height. So the area of this whole thing should be base times height, right? But remember, I came and created a duplicate copy. So this is twice as much as it should be. So that's why it's one half based on size. OK, so what I'm getting at is that as the geometric shapes became more complicated, we just got fancier and fancier with how we came up with ways to measure them until we got to something like that. And when we got to a circle where there's no way we could figure out how to come up with an easy way of determining the area. And so y'all are all. Yeah, those idiots. Pi r squared, <clears throat> right? Like, it's just pi r squared. You got a circle, it's so simple. These people were idiots. So, but the thing is, they didn't know that, right? They didn't know what pi was. Nobody knew what pi was. So they had to figure out what pi was. <clears throat> and how did they actually get it? How did they actually do it? Okay, yeah, so th this, this method, you may have seen something like this, is, is what's called the method of exhaustion. And this is the way they did it. So they had this circle, right? And they're like, okay, we really want to know what the area of that is. So they decided they would uh, come in here and draw a triangle, right? And they'd say, okay, that, that triangle is kind of close. And then they would draw another one, another one, another one. Because they were good at drawing triangles and they could... They could get areas of triangles, and they're, they're good with that. But see, everything in the yellow is, is error, right? E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, error. So what they would do instead is they would come back in here, and they'd say, all right, well, all right, let me see, what can I do? And they said, I'll take a smaller triangle, right? And I'll put smaller triangles in there. And if I zoom in, 